saying earlier, I mean, I think one of the, er the most interesting areas that we're dealing with in game design right now is how to uh, deal with the interface. I mean, it's a constant, ongoing discussion in terms of how do we get the best possible gameplay for players. The thing that I find challenging to that is that the generation we're dealing with now hasn't had buttons, doesn't know about buttons. And there's a whole bunch of techniques and contraptions that we can use to add button play to our experiences. But I think it's important to think about the way motion works and touch works. And we have this great opportunity where we'll have Sidekick tell us all about it. So without further ado, I'll pass over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much for being here. I how many people, and I'm, you're all looking great. And you're doing good. Um, my name is Guy Bendov. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Sidekick Studios. Uh, we're a small team in Israel, 25 people. Um, I hope we're good. Oh, okay. Um, Sidekick was founded um, about uh, three years ago. Um, and our first customer was another Israeli customer called PrimeSense. In PrimeSense, we're the guys who essentially have the brains or part of the brains inside the Kinect. That took us into a very interesting world of new interfaces. Um, over the last three years, we worked with many companies and many new technologies and interfaces. And basically, this session uh, would take us very quickly through what we've learned, what are the main takeaways for us about using new interfaces, how they affect the games that we're doing, and how they affect the audience. Um, I'll have some samples uh, that I'll share with you um, and some funny stories as well. Um, and in many cases, in many ways, this presentation also echoes the first presentation that we had yesterday. The CEO of Wuga uh, talked about the importance of the new interface and how that affects the new type of games and the new type of gameplay that's being introduced to market. So a quick background about what Sidekick has done uh, over the past three years in, uh, ret in retrospect and also in light of the new type of interfaces. So the first two years, I'd say, we were really focused on motion controls. We were working with several new technologies that involve the Kinect or Kinect-like technologies and we really use that to explore the different type of games you can do. Essentially, there, we found that there are two very important elements to creating games, the input and the output. What type of control you're using and what type of output you have. The output hasn't changed much. It is a screen. It can be a personal screen like we find today in our tablets and phones or it can be a big screen that's shared with the entire family, like our TV that's connected to game consoles. Um, the first few games that we've done were actually for a Chinese audience. Uh, we worked with a company that's uh, uh, partnered with Lenovo to take out a new game console there that has a Kinect-like interfaces. And we created for them a few sports game airtime, about six games that through them we learned how to use Kinect. We tried to figure out the best ways to use motion control and how motion control can be used to create some new ideas. So other than doing the obvious uh, soccer, kicking uh, a ball, um, in tennis, we tried to innovate with stuff like uh, skydiving and how to use your position for the two hands in your head uh, in creating a new type of experience. Um, through 2012, um, we worked with Square Enix, and um, Square, we're actually approaching us, everybody's aware of Square Enix, I assume, approach us with um, a few properties uh, for Kinect, and one was an obvious uh, decision, 
Mini Ninjas. Mini Ninjas was actually done close to here by IO Interactive uh, back in 2009. And bringing that property to life again through Kinect uh, was a really fun experience for us. And we have um, um, pretty much followed the tagline of what we do, hit make heroes, by bringing that experience of, to the entire set of users of being a, a small ninja and using your hands to fight you know, swords, using a sword, using a, a, a star you know, to throw a star, um, and um, arc, bow and arrow type of experiences. Motion interfaces and touch interfaces really caught the heart of a lot of technology companies. And one of the companies that is, has been invested in that market is Intel. Intel came out with Ultrabooks uh, last year, and they approached us to really find for them a number of games, a number of experiences that are using motion and touch. And we've created for them a number of mini games, we call them Ultrabook candies, that are, can be downloaded for free um, and really take uh, the experience of touch, the new interface of touch on Ultrabooks and the motion into the entire wide market. We tried to create very simple ideas and we'll go into one of the ideas in more depth later on in the presentation um, and, and teach people how to use the new, the new interfaces that we see today. Um, and last one was Dr. Jolt that is being released uh, next month uh, on iOS, which is kind of a lot of lessons that we've learned through our three years of development and taking that now to iOS and later to Android um, is, is another big step for us as, as a studio. So why are controls so important and why specifically motion and touch controls are so important? Um, so we researched it. I mean, it was good. It was looking good on the business plan. It was a, a very special edge that we had in the market. But we really tried to figure out why this is actually true for most people. Um, it's pretty um, well established that most of the function of our brain are about motion, moving muscles, learning how to walk, how to move stuff, how to defend ourselves, how to attack ourselves. Um, there's a lot of re in very interesting research about that. Um, and one of the most interesting part of that is that when we teach our brains to do something new, our brain teaches us to do something new, to understand the rules around the physics that are around a certain motion, our brain is happy. And when our brain is happy, it's releasing a very happy drug into our body. And I think everybody here um, felt that when you learn a new type of control, uh, whether it's walking when you're a kid or playing a new game and succeeding. And when you succeed, you have that smile in your face. You're happy with the result. Uh, people who do games here, probably when they let other people play in their game and people get it, the first level, they smile. When you know that your player is smiling, you're probably in kind of a good territory. Something good just happened. And that feeling of success, which is a result of that entire process, is really what we're all after. It's really that, that highlight moment that is actually being very addicted. And I think everybody will agree here that big goal for every game developer is to make our audience emotional, is to make our, motion, our, our uh, audience happy. Um, uh, it's, it's practically drug addictive for, for our audience. Um, so why won't we take that entire thing all the way? You know, we'll just do motion games with Kinect. And that actually worked pretty well. I mean, we had some games that did very, very well. We know the success with 
dance and fitness, Zumba fitness, uh, and I think the two big dancing games did very, very well with Kinect, but not all the games uh, did. Shooters didn't do so well, tried to use motion. Anybody has an idea why? Anyone? Yes? Game style, new control. Right, right. So that's completely true. More ideas about... Well, in the Connect, isn't it uh, not particularly much fun if you're having to go like that to fire a gun? Whereas if you're using a move controller, you've got to have the asset, you know, the physical object to use it. Right. Have you worked for Sony by any chance? Uh, I might have done. <laughs> I'm just asking. Uh, sure, but that's uh, kind of awkward and uh, uh, people like the haptic feeling to feel that they are holding something. Um, another reason is that while most people think as they play that they are this guy, they're actually this guy. Um, so when it comes to actually doing activities uh, that require fast uh, motion, very accurate motion, most of the players are not up to the level of uh, Agent uh, um, 47, I think, right? Yeah. Um, um, this is, by the way, why soccer players and good uh, uh, basketball players are being paid so much because they are fast and they are accurate. And not a lot of the interfaces can, can do that. But what can we actually do? What, what did work? How can we bridge that gap and get our players very, um, you know, feel at least um, that they are, um, you know, these... Uh, um, agents, sportsmen, or ninjas. And one game that did that particularly well and gone out of that dancing and fitness level is this game. Anybody knows this game or anybody doesn't know this game? I, yeah, I assume so. This is with permission, by the way. Um, so, Fruit Ninja. Um, people had an urge, practically, to cut through the fruits that were flying. There were targets flying in front of me, and I want to touch them, I want to blow them, I want to cut them. And that obviously translated very well, even though it's rumored that it started as a Wii game, by the way, translated very, very well for touch. That one motion, which is three-dimensional, obviously, but can be translated so easily for two-dimension, for touch, for screens, uh, did very well. It wasn't too fast, it didn't need to be extremely accurate, but it was completely rewarding as the um, fruits and vegetables were just exploding over the screen uh, and creating their own unique mark on the background. And that is one of the really uh, uh, keynote or, or cornerstones of touch games. Uh, you have here an action game that's being uh, adopted and picked up really quickly using the interface very, very well um, and also uh, can be translated and translated very well for Kinect later on when people with the same, with the same idea basically wave their hand understanding what they need to do in doing that without the need to be super accurate, uh, but getting a lot of reward for that. Um, and for, for me and for other people, this is one of the prime examples of the right use of touch control and in a way that's also translated very, very well into, um, into motion and vice versa. The other case that I'll try to show you because I can't connect my own computer is Dr. Jolt. And Dr. Jolt for us was, you know, that type of uh, interesting experience. And can anybody help us to, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. So we'll do a quick, quick demo 
um, and then we'll jump into the conclusions. Um, and I don't know if you can see here, but Dr. Jolt, um, Dr. Jolt was um, based on what we were trying to do, and I'm, I'll try to mimic my fingertip and motion. Hmm. Okay. Um, almost, almost there. Here we go. Your tip of the finger um, is actually emitting electricity. And your goal is to light up all the lights on this table. And when you do, you get some kind of a reward. Um, to make things a bit more complex, you can use um, relays to transmit more electricity around, to create a kind of a puzzle. So I'll just put some relays here and here. This is a really basic. And when I put the electricity here, there's a chain reaction that's rewarding in a way. And for us, Dr. Jolt was, and this was one of the early tests that we've done, was that type of game that we can use um, and grow that mechanic and help people very quickly using either their touch screen or motion to pick up and solve puzzles. Um, it translated very well. Um, it translated very well for a number of uh, um, um, platforms. Um, I actually have a motion control version here working with webcam as well. Um, and picked up by Intel to showcase their new Ultrabooks uh, the webcam-based control that's using your hand as motion device and their touchscreen. We tried to think what, what are the main takeaway for using the, the controls and what did and did not work. That to summarize, really three points. Using one gesture or one main gesture was really important. Uh, people are not familiar with the new interface. Even touch um, was something that's new for a lot of people, and it had to be very intuitive. And that's the other point. People really prefer to do something that they've already learned in real life, in other place. And that feeling when you have on your iPhone, when you rotate your list of contacts, um, or using your hand to slash like a sword through uh, fruits, uh, that's, that's a great reference for people to build on. And if you can find that reference from real life, it works very well. And then the number, number three was really to adapt to the right interface. So touch and their different level of touch through different level of phones, uh, motion as it being introduced through different devices, also have different levels of um, of accuracy, of the type of speed and resolution uh, it has, and adapting your game for that level of resolution and accuracy is extremely important for the user to feel in control, to feel that they are actually mastering that new game, that new control, inside the, the new rules that you're creating. Um, that's about it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I don't know if you have time questions or... Well, let, let's, I mean, we're still here. There's no speaker coming up after, so we can indulge ourselves if we want. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I know I have one. I just wanted to check if anyone else does. Let me kick off, and if it inspires you to have questions, even better. So um, what it seems to me is that what you seem to be talking about is making sure that the control interface is appropriate for what the scope of the experience is. So, if I'm running around with like a move controller or if I'm running around with a connect, there's a lot of energy being expressed. But actually, a lot of people will want to sit there on the sofa and just do a simple motion. When I know for myself, I use uh, connect a lot with Love Film and I go, next episode, please. You know, that simple right. things like that. So is there scope to do more? Is there scope to do, um, I mean, you're starting to talk about more accuracy as you get more deeper into the experience. But, you know, how do we get past some of the game experiences we want to have where motion or touch 
or even you know, accelerometer haven't really been utilized yet. So I'm thinking like first person shooters or driving games. Are we trying to fit the square peg into the round hole by trying to look at doing those classical games with these new control mechanisms? Or do we need to step back and think more carefully? There, there's a, a, a wide range of opportunities that haven't been explored yet. Um, um, I think touch and, inter and, and motion controls really are just the beginning to create a fully immersive experience. Um, you know, there's new technology coming now that track your head, that track where you actually look, and really make, in a way, the TV uh, look more like a window where you can peek behind the, the bevel of, of the TV and look what's happening on the side, whether you're dri driving, trying to shoot somebody, or trying to solve a huge puzzle. Um, for me, this reminds me, and I am old enough, uh, the introduction of the mouse. Uh, in I remember it well. <laughs> Thank you. Those heady days. That's, I appreciate it. Um, and, and how the introduction of that new interface for a wide market um, wasn't, wasn't as smooth as it might be looked uh, upon, you know, in, for anybody who was born after 1980, I want to say. Um, just like the new kids of today are totally appreciate the touch is an obvious interface that, that everything should have, whether it's their TV or their magazine. Um, there, there are going to be some very innovative stuff. And just like, you know, Doom was a kind of a, a cornerstone in the mouse and keyboard uh, introduction, I think we'll see some new uh, games that utilize these new interfaces very soon. I, mean, I, I, I remember using a Xerox word processor a long time ago where the first mouse was, well, the first time I experienced a mouse happened. <laughs> That's how old I am. Uh, yes, and I have the Apple user magazine that announced the first Mac in my loft, but another subject. So I think you're, you're right. The, the point here, the real point, rather than me whittling on, is that we introduce new challenges and we introduce new opportunities each time we add a new interface. And I remember, I mean, how many of you remember the days where mouse and keyboard was the only way we could play a first-person shooter and first-person shooters would never work on console? I mean, I mean, there's a few hands there. Yeah, you guys remember that. Oh, <laughs> they're not. It's ha. Ah, the trouble is, is half of me wants to say you're right, and half of me says no way. Because actually, we can play a first-person shooter with a controller. We just can't play against somebody with a mouse and keyboard. So, I mean, I think that's an interesting one. Actually, I think it's it's. Let's let's step ourselves back through the day. We've talked about a whole bunch of things today. We've talked about advertising. We've talked about how we get onto the deck. We've talked about you know, how we promote our game, how we make the right game for the audience. We've talked about you know, control systems. We've talked about an awful lot of things about what makes the games industry interesting on mobile. The other thing in that we have talked about, to a certain extent, is the fact that we're going to have multiple devices. If you think back to what Richard Ferminger was saying about the second screen. Uh, the second screen is no longer the phone or the tablet. It's now the second screen is the shared screen. It's the TV. All of these things have some things in common. We want to play on them. We want to enjoy them. We want to get excited by them. But they bring different challenges and different ways of expressing the gaming experience. We want to introduce touch to those devices that use it because that's a pleasurable, instinctive, joyful experience but it doesn't apply on every device that we've got. And what we have to do, I believe, is think very carefully about how we create experiences that people will be emotionally delighted by and use the tools available to us on those devices and make sure that the experiences we create, we can share and we can communicate with other people about what makes us feel excited. And that, as game developers, is an amazing playground for us to think about in terms of design, business strategy, marketing, and so on and so forth. So I, I like the fact that we've ended today talking about motion and controls, because these are things which we still have yet to work out the best balance for. I still think there's a, the first person shooter out there to be made which doesn't use thumbsticks on the screen on an iPad. 
I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it uses the accelerometer. Maybe it uses a combination of things. But I know that someone out there is going to disrupt the way we think about playing even the most traditional of genres. And that's an industry I want to work in. So that's where I'm going to end the day. Um, thank you very much for coming. And I look forward to seeing you at the Pocket Gamer Party and obviously talking to you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thanks.